minutes. Um, and I'll start, actually, Dr. I'll just pick up uh, from your answer there. A lot has been directed towards the, the paper that you wrote and the right. research that went in, into that. Uh, does the science uh, sense uh, the paper uh, came out to strengthen your argument or weaken it? Uh, what does the science show? It, it absolutely could? strengthens it. I mean, we published a series of papers after the proximal origins paper, all of them, you know, conclusively moving towards the, the uh, you know, the natural origin hypothesis. So nothing, you know, we stand by that paper. It was a good paper. We are we're currently uh, seeing enormous uh, changes uh, in technology in the biological sciences from artificial intelligence to biological design tools, uh, even uh, robot laboratories where experiments uh, can be conducted from really anywhere on the globe. Dr. Uh, Koblenz, my, my question for you is, in your opinion, will these types of technological changes make it easier or, or harder for us to determine the origins of future, future pandemics? Uh, the, the advances you just discussed will definitely make it more complicated to do that. Uh, on the one hand, we are going to have much more sophisticated capabilities to uh, analyze viral genomes and do the kind of analyses that are, are some of the feature of Dr. Gary's work to understand the evolution of these pathogens and, and where they come from. And so that will be incredibly useful investigating any future um, uh, outbreak. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that there, these technologies are going to be globally diffused, the fact that there are a growing number of high maximum containment laboratories that conduct high consequence research will make it uh, a more complicated process because there will be more potential sources for uh, outbreaks, whether they are, they're naturally occurring or, or from laboratories. So um, the technologies are not a net negative, but they're not a panacea, and it's definitely going to be a much more complicated endeavor to, to go through this exercise in the future. Very good. Dr. Quay, a question uh, for, for, for you. Uh, we, we know the, uh, the U.S. intelligence community has reported that, uh, that a few scientists uh, at the uh, Wuhan lab uh, got sick uh, in December, uh, the, the fall of uh, 2019, uh, but it's not clear that any of them had COVID-19. So my, my question for you, sir, is what evidence do we have that someone at the Wuhan lab got COVID-19 before anyone else did? And uh, do you know if these scientists actually got tested for COVID-19? Uh, no, I don't. I, all of my data around that relies on the, the State Department uh, statement. There were three individuals. Uh, we believe we know one of them, at least uh, Ben Hu, was responsible for some of the synthetic work in the laboratory, a uh, reasonably young person who was hospitalized, uh, who said to have been hospitalized with a uh, uh, X-ray uh, confirmed uh, disease consistent with COVID-19, but not blood testing. Uh, we do know also that in, in May of, uh, Mar March of 2020, uh, Dr. Shi reported that no one at the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, had uh, SARS-CoV-2. And with uh, another individual, we did a statistical analysis of the probability of that with the incidents in Wuhan. And that is not a truthful statement uh, because of that. And so those are, those are the two facts I have. Yeah. Dr. Gary, you want yeah. to respond? So, Senator Peters, could I uh, read from the uh, Intelligence Committee, the Office, Director of Office of National Intelligence, about these three supposed sick uh, workers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology? And they write, while several WIV research researchers fell mildly ill in fall 2019, they experienced a range of symptoms consistent with colds or allergies with accompanying symptoms typically not associated with COVID-19. And some of them were confirmed to have been sick with other illnesses unrelated to COVID-19. So those the three sick workers at the web is simply a myth. Uh, Dr. Wei, um, what specific hard evidence uh, proves that the Wuhan lab uh, did experiments that, that created the virus? Do we have specific hard evidence? No, one of our biggest challenges is we don't know what they've done inside there. We, we know what they were doing in the past. We know what they did in the fall of 2019, all consistent with the things you would do if there had been a laboratory accident there. You know, filing a patent, first patent out of 600 patents for a, a device to prevent a coronavirus infection in an infected worker. One of the inventors on that patent is a PLA military doctor scientist. Um, the, head of the, uh, the head of the laboratory was dismissed, and, and a PLA uh, the soldier was put in charge of the laboratory December 2019. So um, we don't have access inside the laboratory. We probably will never have it. But the genome inside the virus comports to the diffuse grant in such a way that it's uh, it's inconsistent. I mean, in a court of law, you find someone criminally in, in, for a 95% or greater probabilities, and this is one in a billion, which is greater than that, that this is a synthetic virus. So I don't want to put words in your mouth. I mean, a lot of this is, these are assumptions that you're making, uh, not, not hard evidence. The hard evidence is the incidence of the features of SARS-CoV-2 can individually be looked at in nature. They can be identified with the frequency in nature, and then you can you can say what is the chance that each of these were combined in one virus at the same time. This is what this is what virologists do all the time in looking for origins. And when you do that, you conclude that it has a one in a billion chance of coming from nature, and it meets all seven criteria of the diffuse grant. Okay. Thank you, Ranking Member Paul. You're recognized for questions. Areas of medicine, including RNA, chemistry, coronavirus therapeutics. Before his current role, he was a member of the Department of Pathology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Dr. Quay, welcome to the committee. You are now recognized for your opening statement. Committee Chair Senator Peters, Ranking Member Senator Paul, Committee Members, Invited Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. I am a physician scientist and have a 50-year career spanning academic medical research, biotechnology, and scientific fraud investigation. My biography summarizes my career. I speak today, however, as an independent scientist. I do not receive any NIH or NIAID funding. Scientists dependent on NIH or NIAID funding may have pressure to publicly agree with orthodoxies that privately they admit are wrong. My approach to the COVID pandemic origin that killed 20 million plus people, caused $20 trillion in economic damage, is based on six approaches to the data and the events. I'll start with something Dr. Gary said privately, quote, someone should tell Nature, meaning the British Journal, that the fish market probably did not start the outbreak, end quote. I agree with Dr. Gary. Unfortunately, one reason we are having these hearings is that the public statements of many virologists have not been congruent with their private conversations. In any case, I'll describe the six approaches to the question that all support a lab leak as a source and can go deeper into each of those with questions. 
First, the virus was spreading in Wuhan and around the world in the fall of 2019, months before the first case in the Hunan seafood market. This is supported by 14 observations or evidence. The evidence includes the calculation of the time to the most recent common ancestor, hospital overloads in Wuhan, antibodies in patients from Italy, Spain, and the U.S., wastewater samples from Brazil, sick athletes at the October Wuhan military games, school closings in Wuhan, <coughs> and dozens of documented patients. This dismisses out of hand the market as the origin. But second, let's look at the market data. The human infections, the animal samples, and the environmental specimens. These generate eight observations. No infected animals in the market or the supply chain were infected. No infected wildlife vendors were in, had SARS. All human infections are the non-ancestral lineage B. The environmental specimens with animal DNA have no SARS-2. One vendor had animals from southern China where SARS-2 came from, but this vendor and his animals are negative for SARS-2. Now, only one of 14 environmental samples with raccoon dog DNA contains SARS reads, and that contains one read out of 210 million. 13 of the 14 raccoon dog DNA specimens had no SARS-2. With SARS-1, literally 100% of the market animals were infected. I frankly think it is shameful for scientists to mislead journalists and the public saying these data I just described are evidence raccoon dogs were infected with SARS-2. This is why trust in science is broken. None of these data are consistent with an infected animal passing SARS-2 to a human at the market. The 1,500-kilometer distance to the nearest SARS-2-related virus is like the distance from Washington, D.C. to the Florida Everglades. Imagine you're at dinner at a restaurant in North Bethesda near the NIAID labs. You get sick, and you are told that the virus you caught is only found in bats from the Everglades, but it also happens to be under study at the laboratories you, you see outside the restaurant window. That's what the market origin people are asking you to believe. Third, documented events at or related to Wuhan Institute of Virology beginning in March 2019 are consistent with the expected activities when a lab-acquired infection has occurred. This timelines include unusual attention from the Chinese Communist Party, uh, leading to the PLA physician soldier being put in charge. Large tender requests to repair biosafety equipment. A virus database disappearing in the middle of the night. Large tender requests for a lab security force to, quote, handle foreign personnel, end quote. Patents for a device to prevent a lab-acquired infection. Rumors in the virology community of a new SARS virus in the lab. 30 vials of the three most dangerous viruses on the planet being shipped illegally from a lab in Canada to WIV in March. And then one of those pathogens being found as a major contaminant in a BLSA lab in December. These events taken together are a classic example of closing the barn door after the horse has left. Fourth, the evidence that is found in a natural zoonosis with respect to the animal host, the virus, and the human are missing with COVID. 96,000 animals were tested and are negative for SARS-2. 43,000 blood samples from blood donors in Wuhan were tested. A natural spillover like SARS-1 would have produced about 260 positives. A, lab's, a lab accident would be, would be zero, and of course, zero is what is found. With respect to the virus, a spillover produces posterior diversity in the virus genome. A lab leak does not. SARS-2 has no posterior diversity. Natural spillovers, as Dr. Gary indicated this morning, involve multiple markets. SARS-1 began in southern China, had 11 spillovers in 11 different markets in nine different cities. Christian Anderson, the proximal origin of SARS-2, uh, SARS said SARS-2 was one person being infected with one animal. I agree. Fifth, the genome of SARS-2 has eight features found in a synthetic virus that are not found in natural viruses. The probability that SARS-2 came from nature based on these features is one in a billion. These features are the backbone, the receptor binding domain, the furin cleavage site, the genetics of the furin cleavage site, the number, location, and pattern of clothing, clothing, cloning sites in SARS-2 that use the Barrick cloning method and the ORF-8 gene. Based on SARS-2 cloning sites, I predicted how SARS-2 could be made in the laboratory. A year later, Barrick used the predicted steps to make an infectious clone of SARS-2. These same features were described in a 2018 DARPA grant by WIV and U.S. scientists. With respect to the grant, SARS-2 had the proposed back backbone from the proposed region in China, the proposed adaption to human killing, the proposed diversity from SARS-1, the proposed noceum cleavage site number, location, and pattern, the proposed human cleavage site at the proposed S1-S2 junction. Let's close with a thought experiment. It's 2018. Do you think a market spillover of a coronavirus could have happened in Wuhan? Dr. Dasik and Xi have studied coronavirus for a decade, and they said no. How do I know that? Because they use Wuhan residents as control for a study looking for antibodies and coronaviruses in people living near bat caves in southern China. The rural residents had a 3% rate, Wuhan residents had zero. Let's flip that and, and ask the, the reverse question. Do you think a lab-acquired infection could begin in Wuhan, a city with the world's leading laboratory collecting coronavirus from nature, doing synthetic biology on coronaviruses, doing petri dish and animal research on coronavirus with a bat colony for testing, and that had written a blueprint to make a coronavirus that had seven unique features found in SARS-CoV-2? I'll let you answer that question yourself. I have a number of re specific reforms I believe should be implemented, and I would be happy to discuss them during the questioning. What happens if we have these hearings and nothing happens? The Wuhan Institute of Virology right now is testing a Nipah virus uh, in a synthetic clone. This is a US CDA, uh, CDC bioterrorism agent. It kills three out of four people. A lab leak with an airborne Nipah virus would quickly, within weeks, disrupt food and energy distribution, fire and police services, medical care. My analysis of this tipping point event is that it would set back civilization about 250 years. The work of this committee is critical. If we now fail to act with the knowledge we have history, if it can still be recorded, we'll judge us poorly. Thank you for your time. Governors, thank you. Professor of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers University. He also serves as the laboratory director for the Waxman Institute. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Marshall, you recognize for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think, it's, first of all, it's important to remember why we're here today. We're here today because we don't want to have another pandemic like this. I think it's important that we recognize that a million Americans have lost a loved one, and they're still looking for closure. We have 15 million Americans with long COVID. And perhaps if we knew the origin of COVID and the development, maybe that would give us a clue how to treat us. Um, I want to start 
with Dr. Quay and go back to the Diffuse grant for just a second. Uh, this is a grant by EcoHealth and Peter Daszak. Recall that Peter Daszak is David Moran's BFF. Um, and that grant was denied, but yet it lays out a framework for the development of, of COVID-19. And you went through six or seven, several reasons that are absolutely consistent, that they said they would do X and they did X. And what are the chances of all those things ending up in a COVID virus? Yeah, well, again, just as a reminder, so they, they said they were going to go to a particular spot in southern China uh, to get a virus. They were going to make sure that it had diversity from SARS-1 of about 25%. They were going to put it into uh, humanized mice to enhance its ability to recognize the receptor binding domain. They're going to put fear and cleavage site in a very particular spot. You know, out of 13,000 letters in the spike protein, they said in the grant they're going to put it at a spot called the S1, S2 junction. They, uh, they, they said, uh, and so all of those were found in SARS-CoV-2. Its nearest neighbor is from the same area. It's, it has a 99% binding affinity for, this, for the human receptor. SARS-1 jumped into humans. It only had 15% of the epidemic changes it needed to become what, what do you think the chances of all six well, or seven I've days? quantified it because I like statistics and it's one in 1.2 billion. So a one in a billion chance all that comes to fruition. There were some comments on that grant in the margin. So Dr. Barrick, North Carolina, developed the technology for the, the protein spike. He taught Dr. Xi. He gave them humanized mice. Again, this was all funded with USAID grant, grant money as well. What were some of the comments in the margin you think that are significant? Well, this is important because the, 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 the folks told DARPA, we're going to do this research in North Carolina under very high safety conditions in the grant. That's what they wrote. The marginal comments in drafts that were only obtained through FOIAs said a different thing. Dasik said, hey, we're going we're gonna to shift this over to Wuhan because it'll be cheaper, faster. Uh, we'll get a lot more done that way. Barrick says, boy, if U.S. scientists knew this was going on, they would think this is crazy. This is in the marginal comment. So they, in a way, they weren't truthful with DARPA in the so, grant. So Dr. Barrick, you, you know, along with Dr. Fauci, the father of gain of function, knew that, that other scientists in America would have a fit if this was being done here. Yeah. And again, so fast forward to January 2020. These two science, two scientists, Dasik and Barrick, sitting down with a sequence of SARS-CoV-2 and a computer would know within one hour, this thing has all the features of what we proposed in that grant. And the fact they either didn't tell anybody or the people they told didn't do anything about it, meant that they, that human-to-human -human transmission was not, a, we were not aware of that, and asymptomatic transmission we were not aware of. This is the first new respiratory virus that's asymptomatic. Great. Those let's let's come back, let me use that, uh, come back to that point in, ju in just a second. You know, we went through what I call the smoking guns that really show beyond a reasonable doubt that this virus was made in a, a laboratory move on China. It was synthetic, uh, you know, everywhere from the geography of where it shows up for the first time to uh, the, the fact that there was virus already spread to multiple continents by the time the wet market break uh, occurs. They never have found the intermediate species. With SARS and MERS, it took months to find an intermediate species. Anyone that says the raccoon dog is the intermediate species is just laughable science. Uh, no progenitor viruses. Um, and the timeline they were developing a vaccine already in November 2019. Dr. Xi has taken down the DNA lab banks in September 2019. She takes down another uh, the lab bank here in this country, uh, maybe March of the next year as well. But of all the smoking guns, and this is the hardest to explain to people, is, is just the, the genetic makeup of this virus. And you pointed out the protein spike. The protein spike alone would be like a person. The, the protein spike that fits into a lung cell would be like the chances of a person walking in the room with a key that fits the lock on those doors. I mean, it was a perfect protein spike. You mentioned the Furin cleavage site. Uh, there's other spots. But I wanted to talk about the ORF8 site for just a second. Uh, Dr. Quay, what's the significance of this ORF8 site? So ORF8 it is a protein that's down near the right-hand side of the, of the virus. Uh, it is not in the final virus. It is secreted into the bloodstream, and it does two things. Uh, early in the infection, it, it blocks interferon expression, so you don't, you don't sweat, you don't have a fever, you don't show the symptoms of an infection. And later in the infection, it blocks what's called uh, antigen MHC presentation. So we learned from HIV that a virus that can block the ability of pieces of the virus to be presented to the immune system is a virus that is very hard to make antibodies against, very hard to fight against it. Uh, two master's theses uh, during 2015 that have only been published in Chinese, no papers came from it at the Wood Institute of Virology, created a synthetic cloning system for ORF8. Right. So gain-of-function research around things that make viruses asymptomatic and things that, that make them not be able to make antibodies to are, are beyond the pale of what, what uh, you know, Dr. Ebright has said in terms of the civilian use. Good, Dr. No so, so really, this ORF8 is a synthetic link sequence, never found in nature, and they place it in here right? They place this link in here for the purposes of the two cardinal sins, the cardinal sin of asymptomatic uh, virus and then transmission with, without that symptom as well and the inability to make an immune response. I and mean, that's the cardinal sins of gain-of-function research. What, what purpose would there be if you're wanting to develop vaccines? Is there any civilian purpose or is this, a, in fact, a bioweapon? I can't say it's a bioweapon because that's in the mind of the person that made it, but, but it is, it is a highly unusual, highly synthetic. They were doing synthetic biology around it and its two functions are quite remarkable with respect to uh, what kind of research you would do in the civilian world. Dr. Ebert, is there a possibility that it could have been a dual purpose, that they could have been used as a bioweapon? So the original SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1, yeah. is a tier one select agent in the United States. So it is in the group of pathogens and biological toxins that our federal government has identified as having high potential for use as a bioweapon in biowarfare, bioterrorism, or biocrime. It, by definition, therefore, according to our federal government, is a bioweapon agent. It is not a bioweapon, but it is an agent that potentially could be used. Is there any good, use, any good reason to put this in the, vi in the virus if you're developing a vaccine? I would re return to my general comment on gain-of-function research on potential pandemic pathogens. It, that research has no civilian practical application. Researchers undertake it because it is fast, it is easy, it requires no specialized equipment or skills, and it was prioritized for funding and has been prioritized for publication by scientific journals. These are major incentives to researchers worldwide, in China and in the US. The researchers undertake this research because it's easy, they get the money, and they can get the papers. Here's Senator Marshall. Senator Scott, you recognize for your questions. First, I want to thank the chair and the ranking member for ho hosting this hearing. Um, we should do this a lot. I think we, there's a lot that we still need to learn.